Welcome to another hour of study of the knowledge of the grace of God. We've been studying this for quite a while. We're going to continue studying it, hopefully with the end result being that we'll have a full knowledge of our need to study the grace of God. Uh, the grace of God is so encompassing that we're not going to get it all in this lesson, but we can get a foundation on the reasons why we need to study the grace of God. You as a minister are going to be called on to minister the grace of God to others. You want to live by the grace of God and you want to be able to minister the grace of God to others. The scripture says in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10, it says, For it is by free grace God's unmerited favor that we are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Verse 10, For we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Well, that's reason enough to study grace. We're saved by grace. We're prospered by grace. We're healed by grace. We're delivered by grace. We're protected by grace. All of these things are ours because of the grace of God that he gave us when he brought us salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, not through our works, not through what we did, not through what we earned, not through what we deserve. Now, your challenge as a minister is to get to the point that you not only believe this, but to the extent that you can, you live and walk in the knowledge of this truth. That you get to a place where you're not trying to earn your salvation, which you've already received, by grace. That you're not trying to merit your salvation by what you do in ministry or out of ministry. Because you've already received your salvation by grace. It's nothing you can earn, nothing you can work for. It's either all by grace or not at all. That's the way we're saved, by grace. The scriptures are very plain. It's very plain and very clear that we're saved by grace, not of works. At least any man should boast. Now, when we say we're saved by grace, we have to be mindful of the fact that saved, to be saved is to have received salvation. To be saved is to be, be blessed. That's this good life that was in verse 10 that the Lord is talking about. We as the children of God that have received salvation should be the most prosperous financially, the most prosperous in our health, the most prosperous in our thought life, in our emotions. We should prosper in every area of life. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Because salvation is a package deal. If we were saved, we were healed, we were prospered financially, we were given peace of mind, we have a peace that passes all understanding, we have protections, we have preservation, we have deliverance, from all those habits or sins that do so easily beset us. We have all of these things. We have 
eternal life. We've missed hell and made heaven. Now, all of that is in one package called salvation. And if you, we didn't get all of it, if you didn't get all of it, you did not get any of it. It's all in the same package. Now, what we are challenged with is that we might not have in manifestation those blessings in every area of our lives. Because we have a, an enemy that is here in the earth realm and his whole purpose and design is to steal your blessings. Steal your finances, steal your health, steal your peace of mind. He's a thief. And he wants to steal anything that's in your salvation package that you're not aware or knowledgeable of and that you don't have in manifestation in your life because of a lack of knowledge. So don't get depressed because that's not part of your salvation package. But you should get a resolve that if it's in the package, if it belongs to me, I'm not going to let Satan or anything or anyone steal it from me. I'm going to apprehend it. I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get it for myself and have it in manifestation and be ready at all times to preach it and teach it to others to give them the knowledge of what's in the salvation package so that they can live a life that is prosperous in every area, living the good life. It's not a good life if you're poor. God did not design you to be poor. He doesn't want you taking a vow of poverty after Jesus became poor so that you could be rich. He gets no glory from your sickness. Jesus was beaten to the point that he no longer resembled a man so that we could be healed, so that you could be healed. We are to have a peace of mind that passes all understanding. It can get so good that when things seem to be going wrong and everyone around you is upset and they look at you and say, why are you so peaceful that you don't understand it yourself. You just know that you have it. That's the salvation that God purchased for us with the blood of Jesus. Now here again, don't get down if you don't have those things in manifestation. Just get the resolve to get the knowledge that you need to bring those things into manifestation. It's not that you're not saved. You just don't have enough knowledge. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you to the scriptures and the knowledge and the information that you need to manifest your wealth and your health. You know, in, in uh, the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea, let's go there. I uh, want to read this to you. It's in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, and that thou shalt no be, thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Well, praise God for Jesus. This scripture says that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But it didn't stop there. It said that they no longer would, would his people, these people, be a priest to him. And because they had forgotten his laws, that uh, their children were even going to be rejected. Well, praise God for Jesus, because none of that applies to us. We've been made a kingdom, a priest. We are kingly priests. We have a royal priesthood. Because of Jesus, our children are not rejected because of our shortcomings or our sins. But all of that being true, we're not under the law. Our children are not rejected. 
we're not rejected. Because of Jesus, all of that is true, that we don't have to deal with that. But it's also true that even though we're saved, we're accepted rather than rejected, we're still people are, re, are, are, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That hasn't changed. God has taken care of all the rest of it, but a lack of knowledge will still cause death and destruction in your life. Death and destruction to your health, death and destruction to your health, to your finances, death and destruction to your relationships. All because you have a lack of knowledge. So that's why you're in school, that's why you're studying. You want to get a knowledge of God's Word. See, we're studying the subject of grace. And grace itself is multiplied in your life through the knowledge of God. Turn with me in, in your Bible to, to uh, 2 Peter. Second Peter, and we're going we're going to look at uh, uh, chap we're going to look at chapter we're going to look at chapter two. Or chapter 1, verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God in Jesus our Lord. Now here the scripture is telling us that grace can be multiplied. The abundant increase of favor that's the gospel that's the good news that's grace it's the gospel of grace the gospel of the abundant increase of favors our favor with God and here the scripture tells us that even though we have this abundant increase of favor that abundant increase can be multiplied and it's multiplied through the knowledge of God the Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. We could say it this way. That grace and peace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of God and a knowledge of the anointed Word of God. Jesus is the living Word. Jesus is the spoken Word. And Jesus is the written Word. Jesus is the Word of God. And so what we have here, Jesus is seated physically at the right hand of God the Father. The Spirit of Christ is in us. And we have before us the anointed Word of God which has been written so that we can study it. We can get to know it. We can get a knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ by studying the written Word of God. And here we have this promise that grace and peace, that's that peace of mind, that's that peace that passes all understanding, will be multiplied in our lives through knowledge. Let's read the third verse. It says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Here we see the word knowledge again. We can receive all of these things through the knowledge of God. Everything that pertains to life and godliness we can receive through the knowledge of God. Now, we no longer have to be in a place of being the people of God, the children of God that are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because he has provided you with his written word that you can study, that you can meditate so that you can have everything that Jesus died for us to have and that's 
everything. He died so that we could have everything. Nothing missing, nothing broken. So, the reason you should be studying, the reason you want to study, is so that you can gain the knowledge you need to live the life that Jesus died for you to live. You can give no greater praise and honor and glory to our Father and to our Lord Jesus and to the Holy Spirit than to live a life that is prosperous in every area, nothing missing, nothing broken. I'm also gonna, we're also going to read this in the uh, Amplified Bible. It clears it up a little more, but we want to see something here. It says, this knowledge is so important because this knowledge will stop the destruction that is going on in the lives of people, in the lives of believers. It starts off with getting a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, a knowledge of his saving grace, a knowledge of redemption. But after that, after you've been redeemed, after you've received salvation, it does not end there. That is the beginning. It's from that perspective, from that position, that you want to start to get a knowledge of everything that Jesus died for you to have and set your mind and your heart to receive it into manifestation in your life, to let Satan have no more glory in your life so that you can walk healed and whole and prosperous in every area of life. Let's read the fourth verse. We're talking about the knowledge of God. We're no longer going to be destroyed for a knowledge of God's grace, a knowledge of the gospel, a knowledge of our salvation. And this is telling us why. In verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's so many important words in here for us to study and, and to, to learn and to believe. It says, whereby are given unto us great and precious promises. It said, exceeding great. These promises go further than the mind wants to comprehend. It causes you to have to think on a whole new level. You have to think with the mind of Christ, the ability that he's given you. He has been made wisdom unto you. He has given us everything. This, see, this says exceeding great. It's not just great promises. It exceeds great. It gets to the point where it is gospel. It is news that is so good, it's hard to believe. It's almost too good to be true news. That's what the word gospel means. But we have these exceeding great promises that he himself bore our sicknesses in his own body so that we are healed. That he became poor so that we might be made rich. That in Christ Jesus we've been made the righteousness of God. These are great and precious promises. God himself said that he would remember our sins no more. We've been given the Holy Spirit who's promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us exceeding great and precious promises. And it's through these exceeding great and precious promises that God's Word says that we can become partakers of His divine nature. See, students, I'm raising your, 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 your thinking. I want you to raise your thinking. Take it up to a higher level. Take it up to a new plane. To become a partaker of God's divine nature. We didn't write this. You didn't write this. This is God's word. This is God saying that you might, through these great and precious promises, 
become a partaker of his divine nature. Divine nature is God's own nature. I ought to aspire to this. But see, to aspire to things like this, you have to get to the point where you're willing to reject the lies of Satan, the lies of the world. These lies that you're just a, a old a sinner saved by grace. No, you're a child of the living God. God has given you the ability to have his own divine nature. And God's nature, when we see through the scriptures, is that if he wants something, he says it. He speaks it. And then he sees it. So God give, gave us the ability to see what we want, to say what we see, and then to see what we said. This is the divine nature of God. You say, well, Pastor, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You can do it through the power of God that is residing in you. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead. The power that moved up on the face of the waters and put everything in the earth in order. See, raise your thinking up. You're not just some old worm that, that God took and, and felt sorry for. You are a child of the living God. You're a member of his household. You are a citizen of his government. That's what all of the scriptures are about. To let you know who you are in Christ Jesus. So you will have a, a, a change of vision. You will make a, 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 a metamorphosis. You will renew your mind to these new ideals. The new standards. See, this is why the scripture tells us in Hebrews, says looking away from everything that would strike, distract, looking unto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. This is looking unto Jesus when we look into the Word of God. Let's read this in the Amplified Bible. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 2 again. It says, May grace, God's favor, and peace, which is spiritual prosperity, and freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts, be multiplied to you in the full, precise, correct knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Well, let's just put a pen in this. If you can, through study, have a full knowledge of God, a personal knowledge of God, a precise knowledge of God, and a correct knowledge of God, it means that without study you can also have a less than full. You can have a knowledge that is not precise. You can have a knowledge that is incorrect. So what we're doing right now is taking our mind and we're renewing our mind to the truths of God's Word. You say, well, I, I don't understand that. Well, study it. The Holy Spirit will give you the understanding. Read it, meditate on it. Receive it and accept it as the Word of God. And God is not a man that he should lie. So if it's in here, it's true, whether or not we are experiencing it in our lives or not, does not make it false or true. It's true regardless of what we, our personal experience is. It's true regardless of what we see the experience of others having. You don't base it on yourself and how you're doing, you don't base it on me and how I'm doing. This is God's Word, the unadulterated truth of God's Word. You have your own Bible, you have it right there before you. You would not be in a school of ministry, I don't believe, unless you believe that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord, that means this Word is Lord over you. This is your Lord. You're studying through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is just an exhortation to receive the word. Whether you understand it or not, you can make a quality decision to say, I don't fully understand this yet. But one thing I know, it's true. And it's right, and if it's from God, it's good.
Let's read the next verse. Verse 3 says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things, how many things? All things, that are requisite and suited to life and godliness. Through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellent virtue. And verse 4. By means of these he has bestowed upon us his precious and exceedingly great promises, so that through them you may escape by flight from moral decay, rottenness, and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust, and greed, and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. It says, this is how you escape the lust and the corruption that is in the world. It's by getting a knowledge of God, by getting a knowledge of the truth. And it says it's through this knowledge of truth, through this knowledge of God, that we become partakers of His divine nature. See, it says here that we, we come into the truth. And that's what we were studying earlier in this lesson, where Jesus came to bring the truth to the world. And the truth is that we are saved by grace, God's unmerited, undeserved, and unearned favor. The truth is that we could not live up to God's standard. So he came down to man and he raised man up to his standard by, by and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has been made our righteousness. Jesus has been made our sanctification. Jesus has been made our wisdom. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus is our elder brother. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our advocate. He is the mediator between God and man. He did all of this through, in and through our Lord Jesus. And he did it for you. He did it for you personally. He did it for me personally. And he's given us this, these exceeding great and precious promises so that we won't fall prey to the lust of the world trying to get it through greed and, and, and things that, that people with no power, people that are powerless, think they have to rob and steal when they can sit down and do what the Lord said that we could do. And that's decree a thing and have it established unto us. I decree that I will no longer walk in poverty. I decree that all of my finances are blessed. I decree that I've received the blessings of Abraham. I'm blessed going in and blessed going out. I have a different outlook on life now because I know I've received these great and precious promises from my Lord and they are true. I know that I've been made a joint heir with Christ Jesus. I want to take your mind up one more level and then we'll get back to some of the study that I had planned for this hour. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Well, we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to start with. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We want to see some of these great and precious promises in the Word of God. We want to see that we're not people that are supposed to be taking vows of poverty and, and, and living a poor life when He died so that we could live the good life. We'll start reading in uh, verse 30. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. It says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, the him referring to there is God the Father. But of God the Father are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 
that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You cannot say that you don't have wisdom. Jesus has been made wisdom unto you. This word is your wisdom. You have the wisdom of God in your hand. You have the wisdom of God right before you. You have redemption in Christ Jesus. You have sanctification. God has set you apart as his own special people. He has you have been born into his kingdom. You have been adopted into his very household. You're a citizen of the household of God. A citizen of the kingdom of God. A member of God's own household. Adopted into his family. You are a child of the living God. In all of this, this is just one of those great and precious promises. It says that uh, uh, you're the righteousness of God. Now you have a class that you're studying. You're a first year student. You have a class that you're studying right now on righteousness. And to understand the righteousness of God. What it means to be righteous. When you understand grace and righteousness, it says in Romans 5.17 that we're to reign in this life as kings through the grace of God and the free gift of righteousness. It's another one of those great and precious promises. In this life, not in the hereafter. So we have something to be joyous about. We should walk in a constant joy, a constant peace, a peace that passes all understanding. Now let's go up to another level. Let's go take our thinking up one more level. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want you to be aware of something. You're going to have the same challenge that I have right now. Getting the children of God, those that you minister to, to raise their thinking the same way I want you to raise your thinking. You say, well, you take me out too far. I didn't take you there. The Lord Jesus did. I'm just reading to you some of the great and precious promises that are in your Bible that Jesus lived, was born, lived, and died for you to have. I don't want you, as Paul said in, in, in his writings, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. Don't be ignorant of these facts. Don't run away from them. You might not be living up to them now. You might not fully understand them now, but if you'll meditate these scriptures, if you go over these scriptures and study these scriptures and, scripture, and study other scriptures that are related to these scriptures, oh, you'll lead a fascinating life. You'll never be bored. Because you have before you uh, a challenge to operate and think with the mind of Christ. To operate and think on a level that is far above anything the world can dream up. And we'll even go to a scripture that lets you know that. You can think infinitely beyond what you're thinking now. But you need to come into the knowledge of it, these things. That's what we're doing now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> it says in... Uh, we'll start reading in verse 19. I... I really want you to read all of these scriptures. Read it in its full context. You see how good it is here. Well, read, and read, it, read right into it and see why the Holy Spirit is telling you this. And you'll see that in the context of it, you're going to be a changed person. You're not going to believe yourself to be wise in your own strength, but you're going to know that you have the very wisdom of God because Jesus has been made wisdom unto you. You can understand and reason through things that others can't. You can see things that they can't see because their vision is limited. They're looking through the eyes of man, through the mind of man, and not the mind of God. They're not operating with the mind of Christ as you are. This is the very mind of Christ. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 55, the Lord says, says My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are far above your thoughts as the stars are above the earth. 
The heavens are above the earth. That's trillions of miles. That was to the Old Testament saints. But we have, as children of God, we've been given the mind of Christ. We've been given the wisdom of God. Jesus has been made wisdom unto us. So now, let's listen to this scripture. Meditate on this scripture. Receive this scripture in light of what we've been saying. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. You hear that? The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So we're not called to operate in foolishness. We're called to operate with the mind of Christ, to renew our minds. Be renewed through the renewing of your mind. You have to get a completely renewed mind to operate like this. And you do it through doing what you're doing right now. And that's through studying God's Word. Once again, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, for they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. This is how you escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. When you start to realize you don't have to lust for things because all things are yours. I love the way he did this because he doesn't want you to think that it's just talking about spiritual things. He said all things. Now let's see what those all things are. We'll read this also in the Amplified Bible to help clarify it for you. It says in verse 22, whether Paul or Apollos or, or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. In verse 22, and this is why, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Now when he said all things, he made sure you weren't just thinking about all things spiritual. He said all things. He said the world. The world is not spiritual. We're in the world, we're not of the world, but it belongs to you. Let's read this 22nd verse in the Amplified Bible. And in verse 22 in the Amplified Bible, it says, Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, Peter, or the universe, or life, or death, or the immediate and threatening present, or the subsequent and uncertain future, all are yours. It's talking about the whole universe. He created it for you. Well, let me put it this way. He created it for himself and for his pleasure. And then he gave it to you in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. What would God the Father hold back from his Son? A God of love, a God that is love. This whole creation, the scriptures, we might go there in the course of the study. All of this was created by Jesus and for Jesus. And then he gives it to you. That's why it says, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. He has given you to his son. You are in Christ Jesus. He is your representative. He is your head. Your identification, you're identified by God in and with Christ Jesus. And so this is what the scriptures are saying through these great and precious promises. And you're not a people. I'm just, the, the, the Holy Spirit has me tearing down some of the walls that come up in people that Satan builds up in people's minds where the, he would have you think that you have nothing, you are nothing, 
and you can do nothing. That might be true outside of Christ Jesus, but you are not outside of Christ Jesus. You're in Christ. And you have power and ability even beyond what you know or I know. But the power and ability that we can know and do know is that this word will absolutely change our earthly walk. It will change our eternal destiny. Destiny. And in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, let's turn over there, we're right close. The book of Ephesians, chapter might be chapter 2. Chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll just read verse 20 for now. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. So we were saying that we are not a powerless people. We have the power to obtain all that Jesus died for us to have. And it's inside of us. We'll read this in the Amplified Bible, and I think you'll see more into it. It says, verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who, by in consequence of the action of his power, that is at work within us. I want to put a pin in that. This power is in us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers desires thoughts hopes or dreams he said infinitely beyond anything you can hope for infinitely beyond you have the power to do infinitely beyond anything you can pray for anything you desire what kind of power is this we have the very power of God to walk the life that we want to walk it and, and when you get a knowledge of God your aspirations are to walk walk at a higher level to start to think with the mind of Christ to start to operate with the mind of Christ. You start getting a desire to go out and heal the sick and raise the dead. Your desires change. You want to actually fulfill these great and precious promises. You want to see the truth of God's word and manifestation in your life. You want to know that you can have these things. That you have the power to obtain them. You also want to know that you do not work. See, this is where Satan always wants to slip back in. He wants you to think you have to earn these things, earn this power, earn this ability. That's a lie out of the pit of hell. It's all by grace. Grace and peace are multiplied to you through the knowledge of God to where you become a partaker of his divine nature, not by working for it, but through the knowledge that you have for it, or have of it. And to show you that you don't have to work for any of the things that God has promised you. And he's promised us what? The whole universe. He's promised us power over life and death. Things present, or things to come. I'll show you in the book of Romans. The book of Romans, chapter 8. The 
book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You know, I like the way the King James does some words, they italicize to let you know that the translators added it. And let's read that without the italicized word. It said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all? What does all leave out? What does all mean? It means all. And how are we, are we going to receive these? Freely. For by grace are you saved. For by grace are you prospered for by grace are you healed it's all by grace so to receive the grace of God to study the grace of God and receive the grace of God you can have no greater undertaking it will cause you to make a metamorphosis it will cause you to elevate your thinking and we do it by receiving the knowledge of God. And you want to receive it till, till you know in your life that the scripture that says my people for, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge will not be true in your life. Because you will set your heart to receive the knowledge of God concerning everything that pertains to life and godliness. And that's prosperity, that's health, that's peace of mind, that's sound relationships, that's having your children under control, not letting Satan take your children. Those are the things that we have been promised. Great and precious promises. Going back over some of the things that we, we, we stated, that the true gospel is that we're justified by grace alone. And the false apostles and false teachers always want to present to you a conditional grace or conditional gospel. The gospel is conditioned upon works. And the works that are referred to are the works of the law which basically boil down to the Ten Commandments and any others that they might think up in their own mind. But I want you to see in the scriptures that it's not grace, I mean it's not works that save a person. And when we go to operating in works, it causes us to do something that the scripture calls fall from grace. In other words, grace is at this level, works is at this level, and we've fallen from grace into works. You're not going to receive all those great and precious promises under works because you cannot work for them to get them. You want an eternal salvation, eternal prosper, prosperity eternal health. You want the body not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You want to live and reign with Christ forever. Going from one level, it says that we're to go throughout all of eternity, going from one transcendent level of glory to another. Just keep going higher forever. <coughs> and you obtain all of these things through the grace of God. We'll look there in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 4 through 6. Galatians chapter 5. And verses 4 through 6. It 
It says in, in uh, Galatians 5, chapter 5, verse 4, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Grace is a higher place. It's a higher level that God brought us to in and through Christ Jesus. And when you go to trying to earn your salvation, trying to work for it, trying to get to a place that you deserve all these great and precious promises, you have fallen from grace. You fall into a place that is so far below who you are in Christ Jesus that you will operate in absolute misery because you're not operating in the power that you know that you should be living under. But you don't get it by works. That's the deception of Satan. You get it, but well, we'll go into it in our next hour exactly how you, you get this. Verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So you don't get this by doing any work. See, this was written to, to a Jewish uh, people that had a Jewish mindset, and they knew about circumcision, which was one of the works of the law. They had to be circumcised. They said, you're not going to get it because you're circumcised. You're not going to get these things because you're not circumcised. It says you're going to get them and get them from one reason only, that's because of the love of God that your faith works by. Not your love. Your love is sometime. You say, well, my faith works by love. And yes, it does, but not by your love, by God's love. It was because of His love, His manifested love for us, that we receive grace. Grace is the manifested love of God that we receive unconditionally. You just receive it. And if you receive anything, you'll know when you really have received it because you will start to say, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, we want to uh, stop here. And, and I want you to do something that... Uh, uh, will help you to sort of solidify your thinking. I want you to give me a response paper on the, the things that you've heard over the last two hours. I want you to uh, make it a one-page response paper. For the first half of the page, I want you to write what you've learned. Uh, you only have a half a page to do this, so you're going to have to condense. I imagine you've learned a lot of things, but you're going to have to condense it. And just put in your own words what you've learned over the past two weeks. And then on the second half of the page, I want you to write down what you intend to do with what you've learned. You're going to teach it. You're going to live it. You're going to meditate it. What are you going to do? How has this affected your life? You've learned things in the Word of God. Now put that on the first half of the paper, limit it to one page. So it means you have to bring this down and make your thinking more concise in what you intend to do with what you learned. Well, until our next hour when we study how to, to manifest these things, these great and precious promises, that what we're to do to bring these things into manifestation, I, I want you to do your response paper and then meditate on that. And then next hour we'll start talking about the things that you can do to bring these great and precious promises into manifestation in your life. So until next time, this is Pastor Stewart signing off. <music>